I was told to wait for the ding, which feels about right yes. when we're talking about <laughs> parenting, because we're constantly waiting for some answers, and I'm so happy to tell you that today we have them. I'm Jenna Bush Hager, I'm the host of Hoda and Jenna on the Today Show, and I'm so thrilled to be here with you in Aspen with these badass ladies, all of whom I have met before and can talk about parenting far better than I can. Dr. Elisa Pressman is a developmental psychologist with two decades of experience, She's also Hoda and my personal guru. <laughs> she, you, if you have not read her book, the New York Times bestselling book, The Five Principles of Parenting, you should get it right now. I think it's in the store. <laughs> Rishma Sojani, I hope I just said that right. Totally did. Okay. Is the best. <laughs> she is the founder and CEO of Girls Who Code. Um, yes, you should clap for her. She has also done some incredible work. She's the founder and CEO of Moms First. It advocates for policies to support mothers impact, impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Grace Bastidas is the editor-in-chief of Parents. She is the first woman of color to ever hold that position in the 100 years <laughs> of that institution. So thank you again for being here, ladies, and I'm sorry it's a little hot. I was telling them that last year I interviewed Amor Tolls in the same tent, and for one moment I was like, oh my God, I'm going to faint. I'm going to faint right here with Amor Tolls, who's going to have to stand up and catch me. Um, but luckily we have three incredible women, so if any of us faint, I know that I've got you, you've got me. So to start off with, will you each briefly just talk to me about your childhood, but also how you've gotten into the line of work that you do. Grace, let's start with you. All right. Well, lovely to be here. Thank you all for joining us today, and what an honor to be with these incredible ladies. Uh, so my childhood, I was raised by a single mother who immigrated from Colombia. So at home, we spoke Spanish and ate Colombian food, listened to the music, the traditions. And at school, I was first generation speaking English to my classmates, uh, slightly embarrassed by my lunch. I think that's a common story amongst first gen kids. And my, though my dad was involved, my mom uh, joined forces with my aunt to help each other raise their kids. Um, I've since learned that that's called a momune. Uh, <laughs> but in Latin culture, there's the idea of the comadre or the co-mother, so the idea that there's somebody there who can be a second mom to your children. So, um, and my mom was a very hard worker, worked tires, tirelessly to provide for us, and one of the things that I, I learned the power of hustle from her, but I didn't learn the power of rest and the need to recharge. So that is what I'm modeling for my children and when I had kids, um, they're 9 and 11 now, one of the things that came to me is how am I going to pass on my culture, my heritage, all the good things about how I was raised, and also picking out the stuff that I wasn't crazy about. Um, and I founded a brand called Parents Latina. It's called Familia now, and it's for the Latin A demographic. And that was a passion for me, knowing full well that we are living in a time where more multi-ethnic and multiracial children are being born. And so fast forward to 2022, when I was uh, told, will you be the editor-in-chief of Parents? I said, hell yeah. <laughs> it's about time, right? Because yes. it's been... 96 years since this brand has been founded, and we talk to all parents irrelevant of their race, ethnicity, walk of life, whatever, socioeconomic background, and I felt it was more than time to, to take that post. Yeah, for sure. By the way, when you said the thing about the mom yoon, I have my cousin sitting, and makes me want to cry, which this is just group therapy for all of us, <laughs> sitting in the front row, who, when I had to 
work my first um, for a big interview in Scotland, which didn't come to be, but whatever. She took my child to school on his first day. Mm -hmm. And I think oh. if you are not surrounded mm -hmm. by those women that lift you up in this journey or, or men that lift you up, find them mm -hmm. because it is crucial um, right. for us that, that work. Mm -hmm. Aliza, um, you really are my guru. <laughs> Tell us a little, and then let's just talk, get straight into your five principles, because they have become a guiding force in, in my life um, and in so many. Thank you. I'm so honored to be here and sitting here with all of you. And I will say, in, in the field of psychology, certainly, and I think this is true in many fields, but we say research is me-search, and I am the grandchild of Holocaust survivors, and I was just endlessly mesmerized and probably lightly scarred by constant conversations about what my grandparents experienced. My um, whole childhood was filled with stories. Um, my grandfather's 99 and still here talking about oh. them. Wow. Um, but, but it's such a blessing and it's also, it became so important to me to understand resilience. So I, um, even in the five principles, they're really the five principles that are what's in our control because there's a constellation of uh, features that are not in our control, but relationship, reflection, regulation, rules, and repair is something that we can do ourselves, and it actually is highly linked with resilience. Mm. So amazing. Reshma, um, talk to me about your childhood. You were also a daughter of immigrants. Yeah. And also how you got into this work. Yeah, um, I, I feel like I resonate with so much of what both of you said. You know, my parents came here as refugees in 1973. Um, my mother was several months pregnant with my sister. And even though they were both engineers, my, my mother sold cosmetics. My father worked as a machinist mm -hmm. in a plant. And we grew up in this like little town outside of Chicago. There were like no brown people. You know, it was like the 1980s. My mom, my name was Reshma. I was so pissed about that. <laughs> I'd go to like, you know, Kmart every day and like I was obsessed with getting one of those keychains yeah, that had your name on it. Hoda and I have talked about right? this. Even Jenna was foreign in and the 80s. I, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, why didn't you just name me Rachel? You know, like, <laughs> so it was hard growing up being Reshma Sajani, having a mom who wore a sari with a bindi on her head and, you know, eating Indian food. And um, it was a different time back then. And I remember one day, somebody had spray painted on the side of our house, go back to your own country. Oh, gosh. And I remember waking up and watching my father, and he had this, you know, this jar of Clorox. And he's just sitting there, and he's cleaning the side of our house. And he was almost like humming a Bollywood song. And, you know, for my parents, you know, they love this country. And those types of experiences was almost like the tax that they had to pay to be an immigrant. And I remember watching my dad, and I say this with love because I love my father, thinking, I will never be you. I will never, ever feel like I can't use my voice and to fight back. And so I was very moved to, I led my first march when I was 13. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a, called Prejudice Reduction Interested Students Movement. I got no. better <laughs> at naming organizations the older <laughs> I got. Um, but, you know, I feel like God has really put me on this earth to like, give voice to those who don't have one. So I started Girls Who Code because I wanted girls, immigrant girls, to have the opportunity to march up into the middle class and get those fancy tech jobs and you know, make money so that they could you know, buy that house and put food on the table for their kids. Now I'm, I'm fighting for moms because, again, I can't think about my own mother. You know, I was a latchkey kid, and you know, my parents couldn't afford the money that they needed for childcare. And so you know, when I was eight or nine years old, my sister and I got the keys, and we walk home, you know, 12 blocks from, from school to our house. And remember, that, remember, I told you about how our experience was growing up in that community, and I think about my mother all the time, and how she felt at 3.30 every day, thinking that her babies were not walking, but running home, mm -mm. because they didn't have any other choice. And how so many parents today have to make unconscionable choices because the cost of childcare is more than their rent. And so, to me, you know, 
I have learned, you know, through my experiences and through my parents' struggles, you know, bravery. And I'm so blessed to, you know, be able with my two boys, Sean and Sai, that they can unapologetically, you know what I mean, be brown, be Hindu, you know what I mean, eat curry, you know, and have a mom who wears a sari. And it's like we've moved along so far, you know, in our country in such a short period of time. I was saying to you earlier, I watched her TED Talk multiple times. Um, if you haven't watched it, it's about how to raise brave instead of perfect girls. And uh, it resonated so much with me because if I walk down the street with my sister, people will say, y'all are so normal. <laughs> y'all, I just love you, you're normal. And I'm like, I'd prefer extraordinary, but I guess I'll take normal. And what I've realized having my own children, I have three, is that my parents gave us the best gift in the entire world, and that was the bravery to fail. Mm -hmm. And we didn't just fail quietly in our own home. <laughs> we were on the cover of People Magazine failing, and they didn't shame us for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, they didn't love it when it happened the second time. Yep. <laughs> but we were allowed, and I think so much now, both my sister, whom some of you know, started a non-for-profit. Yeah. She does things outside her comfort zone. She has the biggest heart. Yeah. Um, and I'm on television. None of that would be possible without parents that allowed us that. That's right. And failure is such a gift. I always say, like, I don't know about you, but I want to be great. I want to be Serena Williams. And she, like, sits at the edge of her ability to coach who says, do it again, do it again, do it again. Like, it's never personal. And to be great, you gotta make a lot of mistakes. You gotta fail. And what, let's talk about teaching our kids, whether they're boys or girls, to be brave. I wanna hear from all of you, but Reshma, let's, because you've really worked in this. And, and I want this to be kids from everywhere, no matter where you're born, what street you live on. Any advice in bravery, and then maybe Elisa, resilience and grace, I'll get to something, empathy from you. How about yeah, that? so I, I came to this topic because I, I, I told a story on my TED Talk about learning how to code. Like, so for a lot of girls, when they're learning how to code, it's like this annoying process. Like the semicolon's in the wrong place, you gotta do it again and again. And I, there's a story that my, my students would always tell me, it would go something like this. Like a, a teacher would, you know, a student would call her teacher over and she'd say, I don't know what code to write. And the teacher would look at her computer screen and she'd just see a blank text editor. But if she pressed undo a few times, she saw that her student actually wrote code, but then deleted it. So instead of saying, you know, sh showing the progress that she made, she'd rather show nothing at all. Mm. Perfection or bust. Mm. I tell this story on a TED stage and I'm inundated by women who say, I do this too. And by dads who say, my daughter does this too. And the thing is, is like, when we, when we have daughters in particular, and I think we do this with our sons too, we oftentimes wrap them up with bubble wrap, right? We want to protect them from physical harm, and that extends into emotional harm. And the consequences of perfection are huge, right? You see it in, you know, you see it in education. Like when women are studying economics and they get a B in a single class, they drop out, yeah. right? Whereas boys are like, I got a D, I'm running for president. Like, you know what I mean? totally are you talking about consequence. one president? <laughs> are you talking about my dad there? Absolutely not. I think it was a C plus. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, I don't even know how to go on now after that. But the, the point is, is that Bravery in many ways is this antidote for perfectionism. And I think in particular with girls, we're gonna talk about technology in a minute, yeah. right? But the consequences of the like button, the consequences yes. of feeling like you gotta do it totally right are enormous for girls. And I think bravery is like such, again, an, an anecdote. Like when you learn how to code and you think you can't and you're like building a website, you're like, damn, what are the other things that I talked myself out of? When you're walking down the street and someone bumps into you and you learn how to not say, I'm sorry, yeah. even though they bumped into you, yes. it's like these, or, or when you're in a meeting and it's time to ask questions and you just put your hand up in the air, even though you don't know exactly what you want to say. So my point is we have to learn how to do these things with our kids at the youngest of possible ages, whether it's tinkering to learn how to take things apart to build that bravery muscle, whether it's learning how to use your voice and your space and taking up space, whether it's also learning that you're good enough, Yes. you know, and that you, mm -hmm. you don't need to learn another skill set or practice another thing that you can actually take up space, have power and use your voice. Yes. 
Um, Elisa, let's talk about resilience and raising resilient children and what you have found in your research. Well, I, you know, there's an area of bravery that has much to do with resilience. And so I would just say that it is so brave to be a parent. You have no choice but to mess up. Yeah. You have no choice but to mess up. And so the best we can do is to start to reframe that messing up as a crucial part of modeling for our kids bravery and that it's okay to make mistakes and that they're not growing up in a world where their mistakes need to be hidden, but rather we are very open about them and give ourselves compassion. And part of resilience, and I know resilience is a, is a big topic, it always is. People say, even when they say, I want my kids to be happy, I think what they mean, I think, is I want them to be able to go back to happy from whatever mm. experience they're having because that's resilience, is coming back after setback, stress, even trauma. The other way to look at it with the smaller resilience would be what I think Maya Angelou says so beautifully is you can tell a lot about a person the way they handle these three things. A rainy day, lost luggage, and tangled Christmas tree light. <laughs> so sometimes resilience is about the big T stuff of trauma, and sometimes it's that little stuff where you see bounce back. But the thing that's heartening is that we know from decades and decades of research that the, the one feature that's environmental, that is consistent across resilience, whether you are more predisposed to being resilient because of your temperament or whether or not you, know, you don't have kind of the natural inclination but someone was there for you, one adult, just one adult, for whom you feel loved for exactly who you are and safe to talk to them and just be, that moves the categorization of any of life stressors from toxic, which can cause massive health problems decades later, and obviously mental health problems, to tolerable, which has capacity to grow you and stretch you and build resilience. So we wouldn't wish these hard things that are above and beyond that would go into that category of toxic stress, but I think we can breathe in this world of perfect parenting that even in that context, having that one adult actually moves the needle. And then the last thing that I would say is we absolutely need some stress for resilience building. So when we have these situations where we're panicked, <laughs> is this t considered like toxic stress? No, it's not. Because you're thinking about it, mm -hmm. because you're responding to it, and because you're there for your kids. And positive stressors are that last category that you basically just have to be present more often than not, and your kids can experience those smaller things that Maya Angelou was talking about. And that is doable, and that is just in our power, and it's free, and it's across cultures and communities, and it's decades of research, so I, I really find that heartening. Do y'all see why she's our guru? Mm -hmm. And we have her on speed dial. <laughs> the three people in the front are like, I see it. <laughs> um, Grace, let's talk about, in your work with parents, about empathy, if you can. I mean, we're not all born with it. There's ways to teach it. What have you found? Well, I just want to touch quickly on this idea of resilience because it's bringing up for me also the power of storytelling mm. and sharing our stories and our struggles and even going deeper than that, talking about our families and the people who came before us. My mom taught me about her struggles and her, my grandmothers and grandfathers and there's so much for teaching kids that we've been through challenges, we've been through hardships, and we know how to look forward and get away out of those situations. So, um, you know, for people who feel like, I've got no time, I'm so busy, we talk about the busyness of being a parent and yeah. how you may not have a moment to just think. Stories, stories at the dinner table to really bolster your child. And when it comes to empathy, um, I would say just really talking to people, listening, not just talking, but listening to the perspectives, their feelings, taking those in, and talking to people from everywhere, really yeah. talking to the bathroom attendant, the bus driver, taking a moment to do that. I remember when I was uh, little, I used to ride the number seven train mm -hmm. in New York. I don't know if you guys know yes. the number seven train, but <laughs> it was a train of immigrants. I think yeah. it's been designated yep. a historic trail by the White House, amazing. Mm -hmm. But I used to sit there because I had a long commute and it was just full of people of all backgrounds. And I would sit there and kind of imagine what they had been through, 
where do they come from? What are they thinking? You know, everybody's just kind of just sitting there, mm -hmm. uh, not talking. And it was such a great exercise in just realizing that even if these stories that I made up, everybody is going through something. And when you're a parent, you're just trying to get through the day. Yeah. No mm -hmm. matter where you are, who you are, we're all trying to get through the day. And so that, by the way, that modeling, you know, when you're speaking to others, like I always think about how we act in front of our children. And that, and and not putting too much pressure on myself. Don't worry, Doctor Lisa. <laughs> She's like, I'm not a perfectionist, so don't worry. But that modeling is so important. I think we see that. We have to talk about social media. And I see Jessica Seinfeld in the audience. Not she has a panel after this, but she has been a huge advocate for Jonathan Haidt's new book, but for other articles that really talk about what this new digital age is doing for our children. Hoda and I are obsessed with it. Um, we talk about it, my husband and I, constantly. My child knows she won't be getting a phone anytime soon, and guess what? She doesn't push back, because that's the boundary, and it's okay to have boundaries, right? So um, I'd like to hear, I mean, obviously, um, th this is interesting, because we also know that it's important for there to be technology and our kids to be on board. We're looking at a woman who's teaching young girls how to code. That's magnificent. So I just want to hear from all of you about social media, what it's doing with kids, the good, the bad, how we can help um, regulate what we see with our kids. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe I'll just start, because I get asked this question a lot about AI right now, because um, we have a lot of kind of fears about AI and risk and safety. And so I think the thing about technology is that we oftentimes, when technology comes out, we put a lot of fear around it. Like, I remember, you know, not being able to use my computer at law school or not being able to use Google search, yeah. you know what I mean, at your job yeah. because we immediately thought technology comes and it's going to either, you know, kill our brains or, like, replace all our workers. <laughs> and, you know, when that happens, oftentimes, you know, certain people get left behind, in particular women and people of color. The reason why 44% of Americans that, I mean, 50% of Americans that make less than $44,000 a year don't have broadband is because we operated around fear and risk rather than figuring out how to make sure that everybody had access yes. to the internet. I wouldn't have started Girls Who Code if I didn't have a gender gap because we terrified girls and we had Barbie dolls that said, I hate math, let's go shopping instead. <laughs> the interesting thing that's happening though with social media, it's almost like the titans of technology. They literally have contracts with their nannies to make sure that their kids don't no, have that's screen time. True. True, totally yeah. true, yeah. right? So there's something different happening right. with social media than just kind of blatantly calling it technology. technology. Exactly, and I also think it's always, what I often do is watch the patterns of what's happening in wealthy schools first. What are they doing? So the fact that you're starting to have a lot of schools signing the pledge, banning phones, you know what I mean? It just makes you think that, okay, we got to make sure that we're doing the same thing in yes. Title I schools. You know, I have, a, like I said, a four-year-old and a nine-year-old, COVID babies. You know, yeah. it's interesting because you kind of, I had more time with my, my little one. And so I noticed that my older one is much more attached to technology. So we are definitely, the Girls Who Code founder has <laughs> limits. You know what I mean? I, too, am going to be the mom that is not giving my son a phone until he's like, you know, married. And by the way, right? and by and the way, nine-year-olds, I'm sure you found this. Yeah. There are, my daughter is going into sixth grade. I would say a third to a half of her class have cell phones. Yeah. And so, and I think it's, and I think if you, you know, Jonathan's book, it's the, the repercussions on social media on girls are much more pronoun pronounced and impactful in terms, and I, and I, look, I see this with a handful of my friends who have daughters that are 12 that have contemplated suicide, that are cutting themselves, that are just broken by anxiety. And that is absolutely, I'm sorry, Instagram and TikTok. And so I do think that this is a moment for us and the organizing that we're doing around moms yes. at Moms First, I've also been saying, well, what are we going to do around yes. this issue? Yes. And, and, and I do think that we as moms on both sides of the aisle, we got to come together and make sure, because we got the power to hold these companies kind of accountable, you know what I mean, and to make sure that we make real changes before it's too late. Yeah. Elisa. <sighs> <laughs> this is such an enormous issue. Yeah. 
Um, I'm going to play the role of what can you do as a parent in the absence of changes in the systems, although I think that schools are really quickly responding because kids can't pay very much attention. Nobody can pay attention. Even if you sleep with your phone plugged in across the room, you have a worse sleep than if it's outside of the room. So I think there are changes that need to be made. We have to make sure that companies are held accountable. But I also think that if there isn't a collective breath of like, we can take this on, our kids are not destroyed, it's going to freeze us up and take us into a place of inaction because we're just so stressed out yeah, about it. Right. Like, ah, this is over. <laughs> so I just encourage people to figure out, first of all, remember, you have to know your kid. Yes. Some kids, this is very dangerous. This is very dangerous. And that's why, you know, we have to get general laws put into place and we have to have protections. But in your household, there are going to be some kids for whom this is incredibly dangerous, particularly during those very tender years of emerging adolescence and adolescence when you're most likely using social media. And for other kids, it's not yeah. as difficult for them to kind of look, not respond, whatever. But what all kids need are rules around it and boundaries and deciding like, what are the spaces this is taking us away from? Yes. So there's no universe where they need to have this in their bedrooms at night. There's no parent that can't just manage that. And it's too much to ask parents. So I would say for parents who have younger kids, this is great. You just you yeah. just say like we're waiting and this is my, and I'm modeling this. But mealtime, sleeping, movement, connect sources of connection, even when you're in the car, like those conversations that you have, if, if teenagers are scrolling on their phones, they're not getting them. So the easiest thing for parents to do after taking a breath and kind of gauging how their kids are doing yeah. with what little they might have, or if they're just doing so much of it, you see their algorithm is terribly toxic. Yes then you need to have a conversation about, okay, we need, to pull, we need to dial this back and we need to find out what it's taking us away from. Because I think part of this is when you add this on top of not getting sleep because of this, yes. you're getting te the combination of a mental health um, challenge or diagnosis and no sleep yep. and social media is lethal. Yes. So that's part of it, but I, the only, it's not that I'm minimizing how big this is, it's that I don't want parents to leave feeling like it is unsurmountable if everybody doesn't take action. Yeah, yep. you know, and Grace, uh, we have to say this too, is this is um, different for all parents. Yeah. You've just said, um, Reshma, that you were a latchkey kid. You probably, your mother, if she knew she could contact you yeah. because you were home alone, she would have given you a phone. And we constantly talk about this on our show, that not all families are the exact same. Some parents are working all the time. Their kids are home alone. They feel better about having contact. And we need to know that this is a, you know, also a conversation around privilege. Right. Thank you very um, much. Right. So Grace, as a, as a mom, but also knowing that, knowing that there is this discrepancy, right? Um, and as somebody that speaks with parents all the time, what are you hearing? And then we're going to have to move to questions because I know you all have so many. I, I think it's what you all said. It's not one size fits all for all families. And at parents, uh, we're really focused on building communities and nuances around what it means to be a family. And I also have an 11-year-old going to sixth grade, and it's her nine-year-old sister who keeps saying, when is she getting a phone? Because yeah. she knows she'd be asked. <laughs> and I've said, no, we've had these conversations really openly. We talked about other friends' phone usage. And it really does go back to having honest, transparent conversations with your kids. I think we return to that over and over again. And like you, I don't want parents to feel an, it's another stress, another source of worry because we carry around a lot yeah. of worry yeah. uh, and self-doubt and then guilt because we're on social media. Totally. So I think we have to just weigh all these, all these things that we've said here. And in addition, for some kids, particularly queer kids and black kids and neurodivergent kids, social media may be a safe haven 100%. where they are not necessarily finding support in real life. So that's where they find their people. Yeah. So it's a, 
it's it's complicated, but we have to take all this into account. I love that nuance, and I also think something you said is so important. The first story I did when I went back to work after having my 11-year-old daughter was I went and with a, a, a doctor at Harvard who were studying anecdotally what was happening to kids whose parents were constantly looking down at their phones mm -hmm. instead of looking into their kids' eyes. And the words that kids were saying, I'm not interesting, I'm not enough for my parents to look up. Mm. And this whole generation now, I mean, if that was 11 years ago, these are 20 year old kids. So I think it is also, I mean, I'm so glad you said that because we're, we're looking down. Yeah. And we should be looking into the eyes of our children because we all believe that they are interesting and enough. Can I just add one more question? I just want to add one thing because I do, I do want to make sure that we don't not talk about moms. Yeah, no, I was going to get to that. I want you to talk about moms. <laughs> okay. Because I, I said we're going to questions, but then. <laughs> the work that you're doing around the burden that is placed around yeah. moms is vital. Yeah. And I know you really hope that it actually gets into the 2024 debate, yes. among other things. Yes, I mean, it's so interesting, so the, uh, the Surgeon General's here, that the two groups that are suffering the most with anxiety and depression are teens and moms. And we often don't think that moms break, but they're broken. And you know, we're broken because, you know, and I had this epiphany for, for me when I had my second child, is like, we live in a country that has no structural support for parents. You know, we're the only industrialized nation with no paid leave. One in four women go back to work two weeks after having a baby. Ugh. We're the wealthiest nation that puts the least amount of money into childcare. A report came out last week that now in every single state, parents are paying more for their childcare than for their mortgage. And we are the only country where men, when they have a child, they get a 6% increase you know, to their yeah. salary. We lose 4% for every baby that we have, right? So we are not supported. And yet we're told as women, you know, the problem is you. If you had more confidence, if you got a mentor, if you color-coded your calendar, you too could be free, <laughs> right? It's the structure. And so the reason why we're so damn stressed is that we got <laughs> no support, right? And, you know... The kids are not all right, but the kids are not all right because the moms are not all yeah, right. Totally. It's all interconnected. And so, yes, we are at Moms First. You know, we now have over 1.1 million members. 40% of our moms are from Republican districts. I often think that issues like childcare, 85% of Americans are like, please, can you please do something about this? Yes. It's not partisan. Most of these issues are not partisan. And so we have to start organizing as moms. Same thing with social media and what's yeah. happening with technology. That is a nonpartisan issue that we should be coming together on, and we can come together on, but we've never been asked to before. And so at Moms First, we are basically organizing that way. And, you know, we have a petition because, you know, whatever's going on <laughs> with the debates, because we want them to ask a question on child care, because whoever's yes. president, I want to know what you're doing to fix this. Yeah. And literally, you know, generally between in like a week, we had 11,000 people sign it. And so, you know, I'm hoping that they're going to ask the question, but we have to fix childcare in this country. Yes. Period. I'm so glad you got to that. I think, can you run again? I know you ran once, but run again. I, I mean, listen. Right? I, can we get a clap? Oh gosh. <laughs> yeah. Maybe? Well, is yeah, that a maybe? I'm a, I'm a serial failed politician. I've run twice and lost twice. Oh, I, I didn't. Know. I forgot about yeah, the second I know, time. See, I know. Sorry. I try to forget but too. But everybody okay. says third time is the it's charm. It's okay. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, um, listen, I, I, right now it's like I want to use my 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 yes. voice to make the world a better place. And I, I do I, I do think politics is broken. I feel like if we can actually create empathy and kindness and a different sort of politics, I would consider it. But at this moment, it's it's it's, it's hard to. Yeah feel like I could do more there than here. Yes. Awesome. Okay. Okay. I know we're going to have a million questions. So here's one right here. Um, this gentleman in blue. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm struck that so much of parenting is kind of geared around success and achievement, not just for oh, the, the, the child, but certainly for the parents, particularly in upper middle class families. So I'm sort of curious if you could maybe speak to the place uh, of kind of spiritual values mm -hmm. of things like grace, forgiveness, self-compassion, mercy, um, things that can really be healing and restorative in the, in the treadmill and drive of what's next and how can we be more successful? I love that question. Who, who wants to I, take I that? I can talk a little bit about that. Uh, so 
At Parents, uh, a couple of years ago, we did a survey to find out what people value right now because we looked at the different decades and how it's just shifted a lot. And we found, and this was just a, a couple of years ago, we found that kindness was the number one thing that they want, that parents and readers of parents want to instill in their children and that sense of compassion. So that's one of the reasons that we've been so focused on community building and just bringing back that humanity that we yeah. all missed during the pandemic. I was recently at my daughter's graduation and the valedictorian stood up. They had a valedictorian. <laughs> a fifth uh, grade? <laughs> a fifth grade. Well, then wow. maybe they do care that's about success. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she talked about COVID Jeez. and how when you know, she came back to school wearing her little mask. And I thought, COVID, wasn't that a while ago? No, uh, because in a child's life, that was such a chunk of time. And she talked about how important it was to come back to school and feel friendship mm -hmm. and community yeah. and see diversity. So we are really thinking about what kindness means, what compassion means, what self-compassion means, because I think that starts with us as well. Yes. And really, you know, we talk about the this perfect image of, parents and moms in particular, and we are showing that, no, it's not perfect, and it's messy, and it's hard, and we all need to just pull together and know that we're in this together. Yeah. Other questions? One right here. Hi there. Thank you. Um, I have maybe sort of an off-the-wall sounding question. Um, one thing that I have found, I'm a mother of a three-year-old, um, is what to me feels like the insanity of our academic school calendar. <laughs> Why do we still have summer break where then parents' jobs don't change, but children are all of a sudden without their day, you know, childcare, and then there's this insanity around summer camps, and they're all different, and they're only a week long, and I feel like the mo my friends that are moms and I, like it's just an ongoing frustration. And will we ever, do you think, see a United States that goes to a year-round school? I mean, I would, kind of, sorry. Uh, yes, please I would, take I, it. So I, this is such a great question because, I mean, if you think about it, why is the school day, you know, 8.30 to 3 and the work day 9 to 5? Yeah, exactly. It's like we're set up to fail in the beginning. And, and I think part of it, I'm a history nerd, <laughs> so it's like I think you got to look back to like, when women were entering the workforce in droves, you know what I mean? And then pre that, World War II. Yes. So in World War II, right, when the men out, went off to work, we had universal child care. Did you know that? Paid leave, all of it. You know, and we were designed the workplace for families. And then the men came back, and we went back to where it was before. And you're kind of seeing the same tendency during the pandemic. During the pandemic, we figured out remote work. Yeah. We figured out that if you have a dying parent or a sick child, it's okay to actually shift the way that we think about the workplace to accommodate people's caregiving needs. So I think this is another place where we have to really mobilize around. And we as parents, and not just moms, because dads want the same thing too. Yeah. They want to take Johnny to school, right? They want to basically spend time with this because they want to like play a role. It's not just moms, but we have to feel like we have the power to actually push back and change the workplace and change the way that we you know, don't make, you know, don't set up parents to fail every single minute. Right here. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Hi, Kristen Prince from Chicago. Uh, Rashma, what you just said, I think is so important that where's the expectations on dads? Because I think when you see nursing and teaching, incomes went up when men entered that. Yeah, yeah. So when we demand more of the men, maybe we'll get more support. Absolutely. I mean, I think on, I'm gonna, I think on caregiving in particular, like my dream, maybe you can make this happen, is to like the next Super Bowl ad to LeBron James be doing the laundry, yeah, right? Totally. It's like we have to shift culture. But I, I listen, I will say this. The men are with me. Yeah. Like, I actually don't think they're the problem. I agree. At all, right? I think it's a little bit of culture. We have to kind of ask. There's something deeply profound about American culture. I mean, that, like, it's different. Like, in there are expectations both for dads and for moms here than it is in Canada, the UK, and India, and every single other country. And so I think that we have got to 
bring them in. We're certainly bringing men into this movement, but basic things like I think we have to think about from a policy perspective is we should have gender neutral paid leave. Mm -hmm. Big companies that probably people in this room work at still have, you know, if you're a mom, you get six weeks. If you're a dad, you get three weeks. So like we set the inequality, like I think about my, I married the right guy, mm -hmm. but like, you know, I took paid leave and he didn't, and we're still fighting yes. about the diaper bag. You know what I mean? We're still in couples counseling about who <laughs> did the laundry and who didn't because we were set up to fail yes. by like the workplace policies. Yes. I don't know if you guys have thoughts on this or Grace. No, I didn't. I, no, it, and sure. by the way, it's true. And if you look at many of us, we're sitting here because I married somebody that took my, uh, my kids <coughs> to a girls soccer game last yeah. night. The world is changing, but if it's like us versus them, we're going to have problems. That's right. Um, I, okay, any, I think we only have time for one or two more questions back there. You've been raising your hand. Oh, well, back, okay. Okay, it's okay. And then you can do the last question, okay. Oh, um, Aliza, I was struck by um, what you said about being a parent is so brave. Um, I'm not a parent. Um, I don't yet know if I want to have kids, but I'm wondering if you could all speak to, like, there's so many more statistics these days about people not have, deciding not to have children or feeling so hopeless around the idea of becoming a parent because of all these reasons you've been talking about, the lack of childcare, the climate crisis, you name it. So I would just love to, when you are talking to parents, talking to people who maybe are not yet parents and are scared to become one, what do you, what do you say to that in this, this world that we're in right now? Well, I, I think people, young people are afraid of the future because we have a narrative right now that the future is so bleak and um, so terrifying. And when you combine that without systems in place. <clears throat> and then the last thing that I think is very devastating is the idea that if you're going to become a parent and when you become a parent, it's so professionalized at this point, it's so perfect yeah. that you have to be ready. Like you have to have so much in place. Now I think there, there's a conversation to be had before you have kids <laughs> to be prepared. And I think that goes very far and being reflective about that and planning and being realistic. But I do think part of it is, and I'm in this field, so I blame myself as well. Part of it is that we've turned even just this natural, beautiful thing into something that only, you know, an elite few can get perfect. And when you have that combined with this future that seems so bleak and how we're talking about it, even the language that adults use about the world, if I were a young person, particularly really young people, I would feel like what I, the adults don't have it together. The expectation is perfection. There's nothing in place for it. I'm not doing this. So I think that that is something, particularly in my field, we can work on a lot. Mm -hmm. I, I'll also just say that one of my best friends in Texas, which we all know Texas, yes. <laughs> has chosen not to have children. And, it, and, and it's for those reasons, but for other reasons, because she doesn't want to be a mom. Yep. And I think it's time that we have conversations around choice. Yes. And if you don't want to have kids, that's up to you. You know, and so, um, and wait, anyway, we don't need to get all Jenna. into that. <laughs> yeah. Um, there was one more question back here. She was raising her hand. I wanted to make sure we get to her. Yes, greetings, everyone. I'm Angela Panton with Girls for Change in Richmond, Virginia. Yes. I keep hearing this word mobilize, and I'm excited about that, but my question for the panelists is how do we do that when we continue to work in silos? Yeah. And what I mean mm -hmm. is that this conversation we're having now, I work with a predominantly black community, and they are extremely behind in this future of what we see that we can do um, to better our parents and to make a better future for black communities that I work with. And so they do not have access to you all. Yeah. So when you say we're gonna mobilize, my question to you is how do you reach outside of the community where you are comfortable, where you have access, so those of us who may not know what's happening can join forces so we can get to the win. Yeah. All of you answer. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to start right? That was a great. That's question. A great. It's a great question. I mean, look. I mean, why don't you go and then I'll go. Well, we at Parents were very engaged with just showing different points of view, so people feel a sense of belonging. I talked a little bit about our community building, but we have a community called Kindred, which centers Black voices 
and is very focused on raising free black children. We have a community called Familia, which centers Latin A voices. So we're trying to, even if you live in a community where no one looks like you, to create that sense of belonging because we know that trust comes with seeing other people who look and sound like you, even if they are not close. There is a sense of trust, of shared experience. So we are trying to accomplish that via community building. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I've, I've built two movements now, and my, as a social entrepreneur, I think you always build for the most vulnerable. So when I built Girls Who Code, I went to refugee camps and the most underserved communities, and if I said, if I could teach a girl who doesn't have a computer how to code, I could teach anybody. And 10 years later, we taught 650,000 kids, half of which are in their poverty lab, half of which are black and brown. We changed the face of tech. And it's the same thing with motherhood. Like, I'm obsessed. Like, I think motherhood is the unfinished business of gender equality. And the reason why we are still fighting for these basic things is because they divided us. Yeah. Why are we divided yes. between stay-at-home moms yes. and working moms, single moms and black yes. moms, Latino moms, Asian moms? We are all moms, period. And we all want the same things, and we all have the same experience. You know, I just had a summit. We had our first community call. 700 women logged on. And I asked a question. I said, what is the one thing that you would change about American motherhood? You know what the number one answer was? Respect. Yeah. I just <laughs> I'd like to clap for that. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I also just want to address this because this, we haven't talked about this, and there is l actually no time today. But at Mount Sinai, we have the Mount Sinai Parenting Center, where it's it's a scalable program of training physicians and anybody in the hospital setting that cares for families to integrate parenting and the support for all of the things that we're talking about into the well child visits, because that's pretty much you know we have 95 to 98 percent of kids will be in their primary care vi visit 15 times in the first five years. So if there is no access, there's access there and there are free, there's free training. We're at uh, over 200 hospitals and then there's parent-facing information that's in the well-child visit that's designed exactly for every community. And um, I really encourage anyone to look on there to bring that to your healthcare provider because you're right, there's no time. So that's part of it. There, the communities are siloed and different families have different needs. Um, and the healthcare system sees a lot of them. Thank you. I mean, we could talk here all day long. Thank you to all of you for all of your work, thank everything you. you do. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you.